Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and go back to Philippians four to be reminded what uh, Apostle Paul says there in that passage of Scripture. You remember that we're we're talking about contentment. We'll finish up this series next week. We're talking about contentment, and and as we've walked through this, we we've seen that. Contentment is the normal Christian life. This is how we're to live our lives. And yet, we struggle with discontentment. And we've, we've talked a number of times about practical ways that uh, discontentment impacts us and, and, and how we struggle with that. And, and then we saw that uh, discontentment is, is oftentimes shaped uh, or directed or motivated by our perspective. And, and you remember the second week we talked about perspective and how that, that perspective, um, uh, we're looking at a set of circumstances and, and we, we measure them, we evaluate them, we um, determine whether this is a problem, whether, whether this is just a bad thing, a good thing, so forth. And, and so much of that is our perspective. It's really based on our own personal experience, our own personal feelings and desires and, and so forth. And we talked about the fact that, that God means for our perspective to be shaped by the Word of God. Because as we saw, um, our perspective is, is incorrect so often. Uh, and God means for us to understand the world and who He is and who we are and our future in light of what he has revealed about himself in, in Scripture. So it's so important that we understand perspective and how we're to have a biblical perspective. And then we talked about um, God in his sovereignty or his providence. We also use that, that word. Um, the idea that God is in control. Thinking again about this idea of, of contentment and, and, and what causes discontentment in our life. Our perspective shapes it, of course, but but also um, going through circumstances or situations and saying, what's going on here? How can this be happening? Why is this person doing this thing to me? Why have I been afflicted in this way? Why did God make me like this? Why do I have these shortcomings or, or, or I'm not able to do this, inabilities, whatever those things might be? And, and we looked at the providence of God or the sovereignty of God and see that that God is completely and totally in control of everything. And, and, and remember, we're, we're building a theology here, an understanding of, of how to respond to this matter of contentment. It's, it's not a simple matter that's solved with, with bumper sticker slogans. It's difficult. And at the end of the day, it really... Um, is determined by our relationship with Christ, the intimacy of our fellowship with Christ, <clears throat> and our willingness to walk with Christ. And so, of course, understanding the sovereignty of God and that He is completely and totally in control of everything that's going on is indispensable. And this is where I offered this definition when we're thinking about what is contentment? It's being satisfied to live within the boundaries that God has established for me. And that really cuts against the grain of, of the perspective of this world, doesn't it? We have standards that we live by. By that, I don't mean standards in terms of biblical standards. I mean, what does it mean to be successful? What does it mean to be significant? What does it mean for my life to have meaning and purpose? And it, it, it even goes into the superficial, we know that. What does it mean to be uh, beautiful or handsome? What is that? All of these different uh, uh, subjective ideas that govern our thoughts and our emotions and our contentment. And so coupled with this idea of the sovereignty of God, that things are not just happening haphazardly. We can rest in the reality that, that God, before the foundation of the world, designed me and designed you. 
and determine all of our days and, and determine the, the parents that we would be born to and, and the, the, the skills and abilities that we have along with the shortcomings and the struggles and difficulties and disabilities and problems and trust, everything that's going on. God, God is in control. And it's essential that we recognize that, that in Christ, I do measure up. I do matter. And this is so important because, again, you remember I, I, I brought this illustration one of the weeks that, uh, that, that I share with folks frequently, this idea of this crossroads that we continually come to and we have all of these important questions that, that, that sometimes plague us. <coughs> Why? What's going on? What, what's happening here? And, and God gives us a, a, a right knowledge of Himself and we come to these crossroads and He means for us to, to respond, to consider the circumstances, um, to consider who we are and who God is in light of what He has revealed. Remember we talked about perspective. We've got to look to the Bible. Rather than everything else the things that we would naturally come up with. And so we think about contentment, and it's being satisfied within the boundaries that God has established for me. God made you the way you are, and He wanted you to be made that way. It doesn't mean that we're to stay in sin. It has nothing to do with that. But, but so often, we become discontented about things that we've measured ourselves as falling short, and reality aren't those things manufactured by this world. They're not things from God. I like to use the illustration when talking about this <clears throat> of creating an art project. And God has created each one of us, and we're His, in some measure, we're His project. And He designed us the way that He wanted us to be. And my life isn't spinning out of control. God made me. And who am I or who is anybody else in this world to contradict and say, you're not good enough. You don't measure up. You're falling short in this area. And it's because we come up with these false standards. And all of it leads to discontentment. That's the point. We live our lives upset, groaning, <laughs> angry, frustrated, feeling like we don't measure up, feeling like we're falling short, and all the while, God is standing there going, where did you come up with this? What's the measuring stick that you're using in your life? So I'm, I'm learning contentment as I'm being satisfied to live within the boundaries that God has established for me. doesn't mean I don't try to better myself. I do. But it's being at peace with who God has made me to be. And so we talked about this, this idea of the sovereignty or the control of God and the design of, of creation. And then we, we began talking about last week, what is it that is the, the source or the center of our motivation? You remember I posed this question, why do I do what I do? Why do I respond the way that I respond? Why do I react the way that I react? Why do I like the things that I like and why do I dislike the things that I dislike? And I shared with you uh, the, the scriptural understanding or explanation of why I do what I do. Proverbs 4.23 Watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. And, and understanding, and this, this just flies in the face of of the contemporary wisdom, this idea that we are shaped, that we are driven by the external, by our circumstances, by our past, by our mistakes, by our family, our background, our upbringing, our education or lack thereof, and, and just keep going on with the list, all of these external things. And that flies in the face of what Scripture teaches because it tells us that everything comes from our heart. Our, our, our words, our thoughts, our actions all comes from our heart. It comes from who we are. Why do we do what we do? You remember I gave you, I answered the question, because I want to. That's why I do what I want, what I do. Because I want to do it. 
And then we talked about the fact that Scripture shows us that our heart is corrupted. That, that it's, it's because of the fall, it's broken. And so when God tells me to watch over, to guard my heart, He's using that military term there, giving us the idea of setting, almost as if we think about an armed guard or armed guards around our heart, recognizing my natural tendency to respond in ways that are, that are inappropriate, that are inconsistent with what it means to be a follower of Christ, that are inconsistent with God's expectations and God's perspective and understanding of reality. So he tells us to watch over and to guard our hearts with all diligence, but our hearts are broken. And I ended our time last week thinking about this idea, okay, so, so what is the problem? How does this impact me practically? What does it look like? And how do I do something about it? And I suggested to you that the whole matter of discontentment is really a matter of worship. And that brings us to our time together tonight with this question. What is it that you worship? What do you worship? Now I'm sure that, that as you see that up on the board, it probably seems like an absurd question here on Wednesday night to ask the folks that are coming to church on Wednesday night. My word, what do you think we worship? That's a silly question. But but I I'd like to show you from Scripture tonight that we are more often than we might imagine worshiping things that we would not like to admit. <laughs> Does it depend on what you, how you determine or you see what worship means? Well, it does. Because like you worship different things at different times. I worship good weather. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't actually wash it, but in your head you're thinking, well, something made my day great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're, you're worshiping that. You're giving thanks for that, even though you might not actually say that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good point you bring up, and we're going to address that, and I think it'll be addressed as we define worship and we show how the worship of our heart is so easily and so frequently misdirected. And that's where the discontentment comes in and why we do what we do. So stay with me and let me, let me unpack that with you. But let's again be reminded of what Paul says, what our foundational scripture that has guided us through this entire study. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 10. Uh, Paul offers great hope here. This is a man who has, we, we talk, experienced tremendous upheaval and turmoil. He writes this, verse 10, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content. And that's what we're doing in this study, isn't it? We're learning contentment, so we can put it into practice. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. There's the secret right there, verse 13. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we commit the reading and study of Your Word to You. We ask again that your Holy Spirit would minister to us. Your children have come to your table and we ask that you would feed us. Help us, Lord, to know you, to be transformed by your word, to be conformed to the image of Christ, to live in contentment as followers of Jesus Christ, that others would see and marvel and that it would glorify Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. What do you worship? What is it that we worship? Last week, of course, we talked about the heart being the center and also that it's corrupted. And we're going to expand on that. <clears throat> I would like to, to begin our discussion, begin building uh, this piece of, of our, our understanding of contentment 
addressing this idea of worship, and I would submit to you that Scripture teaches that we were made to worship and glorify God. Now this is by design, first off. It extends beyond just human beings, but of course human beings being the crowning achievement of God's creation. Created in the image of God. That's significant. It should mean something in our lives. It should change the way that we look at ourselves. The way that we think about ourselves. That we're created in the image of God. Turn with me, if you will, uh, Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19. Thinking about this idea that we were made to worship and to glorify God. And this is by design. Psalm chapter 19. Verse 1 says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. If you're familiar with that psalm, you know that the psalmist continues on in that, speaking about God's creation, which of course includes us. God's creation glorifying Him. It's by design. He says in the, the psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God. Their existence tells of the existence of God, of the creative handiwork of God. They're testifying to the glory of God in the same way that we are as well. God has, in creating us, set this creation to glorify Him. Just by its existence. Because if it's not for God creating it, it's not there. All that is, in Colossians we say, all that is, is created by God and sustained by God. And, and the existence of creation is testifying to the presence, to the reality, to the glory of God. All things are created to worship God. God, by design, just the fact that they exist, it glorifies God because He made it. But also by implication. Turn with me to, to verse, uh, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Not only we made to worship and glorify God by design, but also by implication. Revelation chapter 4. In verse 11. We see this scene here in Revelation chapter 4. John is, is there called up into heaven. And we're in the throne room of God. You see as you read through that, the, the focus, the central figure, the central piece, all attention is directed one place, to God. To God. Hey, by the way, just as an aside, these silly books that you read about people saying that they, they've gone to heaven and you listen to their silly testimonies. Why are they silly? Because someone who actually was there, John, Paul, Isaiah, the focus of their testimony is always the same. Solely on the magnificence of God. That will be the response of every person who go, comes into the presence of God. And, and, and those specious books, <laughs> the focus is on everything but God. <clears throat> He's sufficient. When we get to heaven, all eyes are going to be on Jesus Christ. And that's what you see here in this scene in, in Revelation chapter 4. And he says here, Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and, and power, for thou didst create all things, and because of thy will they existed and were created. The implication in here is that, that God is worthy of worship, that he has created all things, and that it would only be right for us to respond to Him by worshiping, by adoring, by recognizing who He is. Again, we see that this picture, anytime someone comes into the presence of God throughout Scripture, there's this John, arguably Jesus' best earthly friend. 
He hasn't seen Jesus in many years. And you see what happens there in, in the beginning of the book of Revelation. His response. He says, I fell on my face as though dead at the risen and glorified Christ. And, and it will be no less for any other person who comes into the presence of God. It, it, it's only reasonable to conclude that, that any creature conscious of the Creator is going to respond in worship. That is declaring the worth of God. Praising and glorifying God. He's created us to, to worship. And it's not simply an activity, but it's, it's a response of the heart. It's not simply that we show up on Sunday morning and we worship God. It's a response of the heart and we're to live our lives in that way. Worshiping God, responding to Him for who He is, glorifying and praising Him. But as we talked last week, our heart is corrupt. It's not honest. We have a wrong perspective. So our worship tends to be directed less toward God and more toward idols. Martin Luther said this, a God, thinking about what is an idol, a God is that which we look for all good and in which we find refuge in every time of need. That's an important statement. Keep that on the sticky side of your brain. A God is that which we look for all good and in which we find the refuge in time of need. When we're desperate, when things are difficult, when, when hardship comes upon us, you remember I, I showed the, the diagram here with the tree, you remember? And then I drew the sun up here and said when there's pressure, when there's heat in our life, it begins to show the fruit of what's going on in our heart. We talked about that fruit of the Spirit. We also talked about that fruit of the flesh as well. It's coming out because of that, that, that pressure. It's because we're, we're looking to our God and our God is not satisfying us. So Luther goes on. He says, To have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in Him with our whole heart. As I have often said, the trust and faith of the heart alone make both God and an idol. That to which our heart clings and entrusts itself, I say, really is your God. The thing that we look to, that we trust in, that we believe in. And again, please, don't, don't hear that. And, and allow yourself to just automatically respond and say, I would never do that. Mm -hmm. Because I submit to you, this is our continual problem, not just day after day, but moment by moment, hour after hour. And I'm going to unpack that in a, in a greater degree here. Idolatry is nothing more than misdirected worship. Here's what I mean to that. by that. It's elevating something to the ultimate thing. It's making something, anything, the ultimate thing in our life. Paul Tripp said this in his book, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. An idol of the heart is anything that rules me other than God. As worshiping beings, human beings always worship someone or something. This is not a situation where some people worship and some people don't. If God isn't ruling my heart, someone or something will. It is the way we were made. And we don't imagine that because we have repented of our sin and come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are immune. The process of growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and being conformed to the image of Christ, the day-to-day -day struggle and grind that we go through, we struggle with this continually. This is at the root of, of the problem that we deal with. And here's the problem. Because of the fall, we were born idolatry experts. John Calvin said this, the human heart is like a cauldron constantly bubbling forth idols. Our hearts are like idol factories churning out false gods day after day after day. Why do I do what I do? Because I want to. Why do I respond the way that I respond? 
because I'm trying to get something that I want. And that thing becomes the most important thing, the ultimate thing. Begin sharing the illustration last week. The man comes home from work, you remember? And he's had a hard day. And he just wants to go in and he's been thinking all day about sitting on the couch with a big glass of tea and maybe watching whatever it is he likes to watch on television. That's all he wants to do. Seems like a simple request and there's nothing wrong with that, really. It's okay to sit on the couch and to relax. That's good. We need to rest and relax. And he pulls in the driveway and the bicycle's in the driveway. So he can't get in the driveway. And his, his, his frustration and anger began to, to grow inside of him from the day. And you get inside and, 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 and dinner is supposed to be ready. It's 5.30. I mean, come on. Every reasonable person in the world eats at 5.30, don't they? <laughs> and you walk in and what do you see? Your wife's talking on the phone and the chicken is frozen on the counter. <laughs> and you're like, you've got to be kidding me. And, and he begins to get angry and frustrated and, 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 and then says something to her and she says, well, let me tell you about my dad. And they're back yeah, yeah, arguing and yelling and before long he's saying things that he regrets later. Why? Why does he do that? Why does he respond to someone that he loves with that anger and frustration and those bitter, cutting words? Why would he do something like that? I would submit it's idolatry. He wanted something. He wanted to rest and relax on the couch. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is, is that it became the ultimate thing. Something for which he was willing to sacrifice. You say, how did he sacrifice? Well, didn't he, he offer his wife their relationship up as a sacrifice when he was so mean and nasty and hurtful? Didn't that damage their relationship? Doesn't that, that hurt her? He offered her up as a sacrifice because the most important thing to him was to get what he wanted. And when he didn't get what he wanted, he responded angry. That's not just with anger. It's anxiety. It's another thing. We think about struggling with, with anxiety. What's the root of, of anxiety? Fear. Fear. It's me looking at my resources and recognizing I don't have enough to deal with whatever the situation is. Financial situation, relationship situation, health situation, whatever it is, job situation, I don't have the resources to deal with it. And in recognizing that, I feel powerless and hopeless and helpless. And the anxiety begins to build up. Why? Because the thing that I want has become the most important thing. I have to have that thing, whatever it is. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's become the most important thing. And we can't, we can't get what we want and we respond out of our heart with anxiety comes along. Now, it's it's oftentimes there's a lot more to it. I'm, I'm painting kind of a simple picture just to, to illustrate, but we recognize how these things begin to take root in our heart. And God throughout Scripture deals with this idea of idolatry. So many times I've heard people talk about that they've tried reading the Bible and they, they go through and and, and they've got into the Old Testament, and they say they keep talking about idolatry over and over again. It doesn't, it doesn't apply to us. I mean, we don't worship idols. But the reality is, is that this is the biggest problem that we have. It's idolatry. It's making something the ultimate thing. It's not simply a statue. The statue is just a physical manifestation. We have our own physical manifestations. They're not as rude and crude as, as a hand-built statue necessarily. But we have our own physical manifestations of our gods. A god, a false idol, is anything that we worship, that we look to for comfort, for security, for peace, for happiness, whatever, fill in the blanks. All the stuff that we seek after in life. When we're looking to something or someone other than God, it's an idol. And you see God dealing with that throughout the Old Testament. You're thinking about the theme of the Old Testament. What's going on there? What's God doing? Well, throughout the whole of Scripture, He's revealing Himself to us, and He's doing it in the context of a relationship or interaction with His creation. You see that throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. 
But specifically, when we're thinking about the Old Testament, what are we learning about God? We're learning that He's holy. Because you have this sin that takes place in the garden. A sin for which, I mean, quite frankly, we would all look at and say, it's really not that big deal. I mean, I just can't imagine that all of the trouble and problems that we have in this world are, are rooted in one man eating a piece of fruit. Is that the reality? But it's so much more than that. It's disobedience. It's disobedience to a holy God. And this is one of the things that we struggle with continually is the reality of the holiness of God, the absolute perfection of God. And he begins to teach us about his perfection. And, and then you have this, this man that's created and, and he, he's not created with sin. And he has everything, this beautiful creation, uncorrupted, given to him. And in the fall, all of it is lost. And then throughout the rest of the Old Testament, what we're seeing over and over and over again is the absolute depravity of the human heart. You see it over and over again. You see it illustrated in the kings of Israel and Judah. You see it illustrated in the people, in their totality, and their response to this God. You have God uh, delivering the Israelites out of slavery, bringing them through the Red Sea that's parted, and, and it's just days before they're grumbling against God before they turn their back on God. And so what you see throughout the Old Testament, this understanding that, that, that we are, are corrupted and separated from God. Why? Why is that? It's, it's what's going on in our heart and our desire to have our desires fulfilled. Ultimately, what was Adam's sin? What was it that Adam wanted? Knowledge, okay. Power. Power. What was Satan's temptation? To be like God. To be like God. <laughs> we have learned well from our father, Adam. Because ultimately, when you think about idolatry, that's what it all comes down to. And you see this illustrated over and over again. Let me give you one example. Very familiar. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. You probably already know this passage of Scripture. Exodus chapter 20. Thinking about what God has to say about idolatry. Exodus chapter 20, it's the Ten Commandments. Are you familiar with that? Look at how God addresses idolatry in the Ten Commandments. Just beginning there. Uh, with commandment uh, in, in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Right out of the box. You shall have no other... Why would God say that if there wasn't a tendency for us to have other gods before Him? And, and especially in light, back up to verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. In light of the fact that, that God has done this wonderful thing for the Israelites, and the very first thing He says to them is in the commandments. You'll have no other gods before Me. I mean, you would think that that, that would be unthinkable, right? That we would have no other gods before Him. He goes on there in, in, in verse 4. He says, and you shall make, that, that word right there, make, is key. You shall, I'm sorry, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Or any likeness of that, of what is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. Don't make things. Now, that is not an exhaustive list of how we can engage in idolatry. It is an illustrative list. That's just some of the ways that we can engage in, in idolatry. Because we make idols for ourselves continually that are not physical beings. You see here in, in verses 5 and 6, he goes on. And talks about uh, the consequences of true and false worship. You shall not worship or serve them. Those are the, the false idols. For I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of fathers on children. 
on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commands. The, 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 the implications or the response of God based on true or false worship. He goes on there in verses 7 through 11 and gives commands reminding us about His greatness, about the fact that He is God. And, and, and just continues on throughout. We could spend a lot more time digging into the Ten Commandments, but you see in there, it's all predicated on this idea that we have this tendency to make idols out of anything. To take something... And it becomes the ultimate thing. The most important thing in my life. Something for which I'm, I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to give. I'm willing to devote myself to. It becomes the most important thing. And, and let's take it one more step. A thing that begins to define me. A thing that begins to tell me who I am. And that without it, somehow I'm less. Or I'm lacking. Or my life is, is not fulfilled or complete. We chase after these things and they become the most important thing. And God tells us that, that we will find our sufficiency in Christ alone. This is what He calls us to. This is the thing that we struggle with. This, this idea of heart worship. Again, you remember that, that drawing that I shared with you. Thinking about what does this look like practically? How does it show up in our lives? This discontentment that we began our, our discussion with a few weeks ago. How does it show up? And we talked about the fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians 5. But we also looked at, at the fruit of the flesh as well that the Apostle Paul talks about. And how that can show up in our, in our, our lives as, as anger, lust. What are some other fruits of the flesh? Anxiety. Gossip. Greed. Absolutely. Greed. Pride. I'm sorry? Pride. Pride. Absolutely. Pride. Okay. So these, these fruits of the flesh, and what, what exactly is going on here? We talked about how we, we, we tend to look at these things in our life and we don't like them. We want them to change. And so we imagine that somehow if, if my problem is, is pride or my problem is anxiety, then, then I need to focus in on, on, on that pride and, and trying to get that fruit off the tree. And I liken that to taking a, a lemon and stapling it to an apple tree. It's, it's, not a, it's not a lemon tree. It's an apple tree. And the fact that you put a lemon on an apple tree doesn't make it a lemon tree. You see, these things don't come out for no reason. We talked about what is the source. Again, Proverbs 4.23. What's the source? It's our heart. And we look at our lives and we go along and we don't see the fruit, this sort of fruit in our life. Everything seems to be okay. But then, something comes into our life. You remember the silly little drawing of the sun? You'll have to let that represent the sun. And I said, this is, this is heat or pressure. And we think about this idea that, that, that someone could go along and, and we, we may think that we know them or ourselves. And, and everything goes along and it's all good and wonderful. And then something comes into our life. Some problem, some tragedy, some trial, some difficulty that we struggle with. And, and that heat and pressure begins to press in on us. And what does it do? It shows us what's in our heart. You remember what we talked about last week? Jesus says that out of the overflow of what does the mouth speak? Out of the heart. When, when I say something nasty or unkind or cutting, hurtful to somebody, where is it coming from? Way down deep in my heart. 
All this is doing is showing what's actually going on inside of me. The pressure, the struggle, the trials that, that, that happen in life. And, and, and we think that somehow we're going to, to deal with these. This is the whole philosophy or theory in secular belief on how to deal with these problems. It's basically behavior management. Learning behavior management strategies to deal with these things. Debbie, you mentioned addiction. We could put addiction on this on this list as well. This is another one. Is that two D's? Yes, yes. I think so. Again, please forgive me if I misspell things. Addiction could be on that list. We could continue on adding things to this list. Where does all this stuff come from? It comes from the heart. But God tells us okay. that the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, kindness, kindness, and so on. We can continue on here with this. Summer splash last year. But we we recognize again in the same way that that this fruit is coming from the heart, in the same way this fruit is coming from the heart. And so, do I want to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in my life? I can't make those things happen. They come out of the overflow of the heart. So how do I change my heart? That's the third tree. This is the three trees diagram, you could call it that. Here's the third tree. It's the cross of Christ. The transformation that takes place in Jesus Christ. As I'm conformed to the image of Christ, my heart changes. And just like I've illustrated a number of times, the idea of the dashboard, when I look at my life and I see these things coming up in my life, where is it coming from? It's telling me something about my heart. It's telling me something about my relationship with Jesus Christ. And you remember, what were the two questions I asked you last week to think about this week? What are you getting that you don't want? What aren't you getting that you do want? Very good. Very good. What am I wanting that I'm not getting? And what am I getting that I'm not wanting? That's going to tell me a lot about what, am I, what I'm worshiping. When I start seeing these things in my life, what am I getting that I'm not wanting? And what am I wanting that I'm not getting? I'm, I'm going over this and adding to it each week. And my hope is, is that not only is this ministering to you, but let me give you a vision for something else. And that is that God has called all of us to be ministers of reconciliation. And as you have opportunities and you have friends that are talking with you and they're, they're, they're struggling with some of these things, and they say, well, this is the problem, this is the problem, this is the problem. You can know, no, it's not. This is your problem right here. It's the heart. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's that you're wanting something that you're not getting, and you're willing to do whatever it takes to try to, to, to get that. Whether it's, whether it's a feeling, whether it's a position, whether it's a bank account, whatever it might be, we're willing to do whatever we have to do to ultimately... We call it appease our God, our idol. That's what it comes down to. But now, what is our idol? We've been talking about this idea of idolatry as we as we go through here. What is it ultimately that we seek to worship? Ourselves. Ourselves. Ultimately, that's the culprit. And I'm glad she whispered it. <laughs> 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 It's so important. We struggle with exactly the same sin that Adam struggled with. We want to be God. We want life on our terms. We want what our hearts want. And if something gets in our way, we're willing to do whatever we have to. It doesn't matter what it is. Destroy relationships. Destroy ourselves, our health. Destroy, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. Because we're looking to these things to satisfy us. And all the while, the Lord tells us, Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, what does he say? In your presence, there's fullness of joy. 
At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. God is inviting us into a relationship, but it's a relationship predicated on our recognition that He's God. And it's going to happen His way. And we're going to go His way. And if we want that, then we're going to find that our hearts begin to be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's just the fruit of the Spirit, of me walking in the Spirit. And it's, it's not, you know, five steps to your best life now. It doesn't work like that. That's silly. It's, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ on God's terms and trusting God even when it's dark. Even when it's hard. Trusting God. Choosing to walk with God. I would submit to you that there's a choice that's involved with this. Remember we talked about Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. Apostle Paul tells us how do we change Three steps he gives us there. He says, put off the old man, renew the mind, put on the new man. Doesn't matter what we're struggling with, that's the biblical prescription to respond to it. My thinking, my perspective about who God is, about His plan for my life, about His plan for this world, my place in this world, and my significance being in Christ alone, I get that understanding from the Word of God. That's how my mind is renewed. Apostle Paul says, I'm struggling with something. I put off the old man. My mind is renewed. My perspective is changed. And I put on the new behavior. What's my motivation? My relationship with Jesus Christ. I would submit to you, our problem is false worship. It's idolatry. How do we deal with that? How do we respond to it? One way. True worship. As my affection for Jesus Christ grows, my heart's going to change. I'm going to have new desires, new want-tos. And so the idea here in Scripture is that our hearts are changed. How does that happen? We talked tonight about the put-off and the put-on. There's something that I do. How do I grow in my love for Jesus Christ practically? How do I do that? That's what I'm going to talk about next week. We'll see you then. Let me pray. Father, we worship you. For you alone are worthy. You are God. You are great and glorious and magnificent. And yet, Father, I struggle to believe that. God, it's one thing to know the information. It's entirely another for me to believe it and it have practical implication on my life. But Lord, we see from your word very clearly the struggle that we have in our heart is not without hope. In Christ, we have hope. And so I lift up to you these, your people, and pray, Father, that you would take the teaching of your word And God, this week as we go about our day, that we would consider the things that we've talked about here tonight. That you would begin to show us practically in our lives what is it that we're wanting that we're not getting and what is it that we're getting that we're not wanting. And Father, we recognize the way that this idolatry grips our heart and influences and directs us in so many ways. And Father, we we know that your word teaches that it's only in our relationship, in the intimacy of our fellowship with Jesus Christ, that there will be true change. And God, we want to change. We know you. And we want to grow closer. And so I pray, Father, this week that your Holy Spirit would minister to us to that end. That our hearts would be wooed by the Holy Spirit. May we respond to the glory of Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Amen.